The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm now joined with Paul Rademacher, who has been studying the intersection between consciousness, spirituality and the Christian tradition. After graduating with a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theology Seminary in 1985, Paul spent 15 years in the pastoral ministry working in congressions. In 1997, he attended for the first time the Monroe Institute and continued as a student there until 2000. In 2001, he became a residential facilitator at the Institute's leading groups in experimental explorations of their inner awareness. Since October of 2007, he has served as the executive director of the Ramon Rowe Institute. So let's hear from Paul. Paul, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Hey, Paul, sorry that uh, that, that, that intro was, uh, there's quite a long intro there, so uh, I do <laughs> apologize if I've got some of the words wrong. I, let me make one correction on that. I'm, I'm no longer the executive director of the Monroe Institute. I left that position in 2011, and <clears throat> that's when I started into this uh, m most recent work that I'm hopefully going to talk with you tonight about. Excellent. Okay, well, let's start at, at, at some point of a beginning here with yourself as well. Now, obviously, uh, you know, you started out as a very sort of fundamental, uh, um, traditional sort of church level, you know, as, as a Christian, and... How has that sort of shifted now? I, I, I mean, are you still a, a sort of serving Christian in a, in a sense? Um, not really. Uh, I, my theology has gone through a, a radical transformation primarily because of the experiences that I've had down through the years. There's a, there's a certain built-in irony to the whole thing because uh, the reason why I went into the ministry in the first place was because I had a mystical experience. Um, my brother and I had a construction company, and I was working up on the roof of a house we were building at, at, at one point, and I pulled on a board, and uh, the board gave way, and I found myself the more show. off the roof. And, um, and when I hit the ground, I didn't realize at the time, but I had fractured my hip. And uh, they came and took me to the hospital in an ambulance, and they uh, did some x-rays of the hip, but they didn't find anything wrong. And so they put me in physical therapy, which was absolutely excruciating. But uh, when the doctor saw, found out that I was having such a hard time, he took some additional x-rays, and that's when they found the fracture. And when he came and told me that I was going to be off work for about six weeks or so, I found myself going into a spiral downward of pain and anxiety. And it was a literal thing. I could actually feel myself spiraling downward. And all of a sudden, I hit what seemed to be the bottom of something. I don't even know what it was to this day. And when I hit that, I broke through into another world entirely. And in that other world, that other dimension, all of the pain and all the anxiety completely disappeared. I entered into what has been called the, pa the peace that passes all understanding. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no such thing as um, accidents. Everything had meaning and purpose, including this apparent accident. And at one point, I found myself standing in front of a being of light, and we're conversing about my life, but we're not using words in any way whatsoever. It's more of a telepathic kind of communication. Prior to that experience, I had been wrestling with the question of whether or not I should enter into the ministry, because I, I came up in a traditional, uh, even very conservative fundamentalist uh, tradition. 
And when I had that experience, I thought, well, surely that's the answer to that question. But what I found over the years was that experience uh, really served the purpose to uh, stimulate an enormous curiosity from me to want to understand that experience more completely, to enter into it more fully and integrate it into my life in, in an uh, ever increasing way. So uh, that, as I say, was kind of ironic because uh, that very experience of the mystical took me into the ministry, but it wasn't long before I found out that there wasn't a lot of conversation about that kind of experience within the ministry. And so I found myself uh, really going through a struggle between my inner world and my outer world. Okay, so let, let me uh, just sum this up as well. So I'm, I've got, got, got this route as well. So this experience that you had, um, this... The, the, uh, how did this sort of lead on as well to to you uh, knowing that that life is continuous and there there there, there mm. you know there is no uh, um, 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 sort of end in a sense and and that you know uh, again I, 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 let me just sort of sum up what you've said as well that 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 mystical experience that you had um, was there also uh, more to it than that in the sense of some of the information that came through as well. Well. Uh, it's funny because I don't really remember the specific information that came through from that conversation that I had with this being of light. Uh, I think it really set the stage more for a, the journey to continue from that point on. Right. So even though I went to the, into the ministry, and I, I have to tell you that I was a part of a, a very mainline, uh, very kind of uh, middle-of-the-road church, and in fact, we we had the nickname of being the frozen chosen. And so there wasn't a sense of, of much exploration happening outside of the normal uh, confines of that tradition. But I found myself, because that hunger that had been created was so deep, I found myself continually going off into other uh, explorations of other conferences, uh, seminars, reading all kinds of books that I would never tell anybody about. Because you see, at that time, I had, uh, I still do, had three children and a wife that I needed to support. And um, the way I made my money was to be a pastor, and it, I didn't really want to jeopardize that. So I had to kind of go through this clandestine um, search to, to find something that really fed me on that level that I experienced in, in that mystical uh, realm. And it was a couple of years after that happened that I ran across a book um, I walked. I was up in Toronto, Canada, and walked into what was then the world's largest bookstore. And I, I was in there just a couple of minutes, and I had one of those experiences, you know, where one book kind of jumps off the shelf at you. And it was Robert Monroe's second uh, book. It was called Far Journeys, and he talks. Uh, Robert Monroe was one of the pioneers uh, in ex exploration of the out of body uh, experience. And when I read that book, I was absolutely thunderstruck because here for the first time was somebody who was talking about things that had happened to me, but he wasn't doing it from a dogmatic perspective or from a perspective of philosophy. He was just talking about his own personal experience. It was very, very compelling to me. I got to the uh, back of the book and, and I found out that there was a place called the Monroe Institute and I, where I could actually go to learn about these things and practice them. And I thought to myself, the first thought was, wouldn't it be amazing to go to a place like that? And the second thought was, wouldn't it be amazing to work at a place like that? <laughs> knowing, yeah. knowing that neither one was ever going to happen because I'm a pastor. I don't have discretionary income. I don't have discretionary time. And uh, But I think it was about 10 years after that, a friend of mine actually paid my way to go to the Monroe Institute. And when I went there, my first course, that world, that uh, – world beyond the physical uh, opened up in living technicolor. It was like, for me, a dream tr come true because this was the most important in life, thing in life as far as I was concerned. So I was hooked. I went back for a few more programs, got even more hooked. I became an outreach facilitator while I was still a pastor in the Presbyterian Church. And it was so important to me that I even did some of the Monroe Institute programs for a very select few of the parishioners in my congregation. And when I did that, I, it, it opened up worlds for them, and it was then that I began to realize that, th that this work was tremendously important. Um, and, but that also aggravated that tension all the more. And so finally, in the year 2000, I decided I needed to leave the pastorate, and I needed to follow this other path. I wanted to write about it. And uh, 
two months after I walked out of the church, I got a call from the Monroe Institute asking me if I wanted to be a, a facilitator on campus. And, it, and again, it was for me, it was like a, a dream come true. And so I said yes immediately. And, um, and then um, in 2007, I became the executive director in, until the year 2011. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, obviously, your your truth in the Bible and your your uh, you know, the, I mean, you know, Jesus is the only way uh, mm. um, ideas as well. You know, with with, with with Christianity, you know, there there's no other way really. Uh, d did you find it quite easy to walk away from from these fundamentals of, of Christianity when this came about? You have to understand that I'm I'm a pretty slow learner at times, and it took me 15 years to finally discover that the pastor really wasn't made for me, and I wasn't mm. necessarily made for the pastor. And even though you know I was treated very well and I did very well, and people accepted me uh, wonderfully. But um, I began to realize over time that when you look at virtually any religious tradition, at the beginning of that tradition is somebody or a group who have had some kind of non-ordinary experience. And if you look at the biblical tradition uh, specifically, because that's what I'm most familiar with, um, you have stories like uh, Moses who encounters the, uh, the burning bush that, that isn't consumed for some reason and he hears the voice of God. Or you have Abraham who hears the voice of God and he goes from his country to a strange land. Or Joseph who, hear, who is able to interpret dreams and is able to turn around the fortunes of an entire nation because of it. Or Ezekiel who sees these wild visions. Or when you get to the New Testament, you see Jesus who goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration with a few of his disciples. And he's talking with up there with two dead men. I mean, these guys are dead. Uh, Moses and Elijah, and yet he's having a conversation with them. Or Paul on the road to Damascus, where he suddenly has his life completely turned around because he has this uh, uh, vision that comes to us uh, and a conversation with Jesus, who himself has also been dead for quite some time. So these are all formative figures in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and right at the core of their being is this non-ordinary experience. But we lose sight of that, and we um, tend to think, well, they're just, or they're they're different from us. They're we can't do that. We're just ordinary people. And uh, I think Jesus' message w to us was that's not true. Uh, he said at one point to his disciples, "These things that I do, you will do, and more." So uh, I, essentially, what he's saying to us is that, look, I'm just an example of what is possible, and it's up to you to begin to explore that possibility. And that that's kind of the the um, perspective that's been driving me for a lot of years now and not from any fear base as well that's right yeah no not at all uh, yeah. in fact in fact <laughs> i think the exploration of the mystical uh, world and the mystical state is is at its best one of ecstasy uh because you find yourself uh begin being able to transcend this this great split that so many of us feel this incompleteness of of tells us that there is something more and when you discover that something more no um, uh, play on your name in any way but uh, but when you discover that something more it's it's like a manna from heaven in a lot of ways yeah yeah I, 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 absolutely and um, okay uh, well where do we go from here because this 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 is fascinating stuff I think really um, I think Let's just go straight to, you know, what you discovered when, when you knew that, uh, you know, when you consider the possibility that you're more than your physical body, um, mm -hmm. what, what sort of doors does this open up in, in terms of freement of, of your, the way that you're thinking, of, of possibilities of what you can do with your life, and, um, you know, just, just, just the, the, the natural process of what you went through as well when, when discovering this? Well, I, I, I know you're going to have to go to a commercial break here before too long, so I don't want to get too far into this story. Sure. But um, uh, sort of more of a general overview. For me, there, there are two, at least two aspects uh, to this. One of them uh, comes out of my experiences, I told you before, of falling off the roof, where it is possible for us as human beings to enter into completely different dimensions than the physical world. But I also had another experience prior to that uh, where I was hitchhiking across the country, and uh, I'll go into more detail that, uh, in that later on. But what I had there was uh, an experience of the physical world opening up in an extraordinary way for me. So I began to realize that... Uh, 
within the physical world, there is this uh, spiritual essence that undergirds everything. And that for the most part, we are we ignore that. We're just simply not uh, aware that that is possible. But then the second experience of falling off the roof told me that there, there's, it's possible for us to also transcend the physical world entirely. And I think that, that if you look at the historical record, you'll find that saints, shamans, mystics, and gurus throughout times, monks, have been telling us time and again that, uh, that this way of looking at the world is, is much more accurate. And the idea that the physical world is all that there is, is largely an illusion. And not only do we uh, fool ourselves when we buy into that illusion, but we also end up um, neglecting uh, resources that are available to, to us that can make an extraordinary difference, I think, not only on an individual level, but also on a community level as well. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The More Show website. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back. I'm uh, currently joined by Paul Rademacher, and we're discussing the Monroe Institute, exploration of the human consciousness and various mystical experiences, including out-of-body experiences, traveling to other dimensions, and interacting with those who have passed away. So, uh, Paul, uh, your latest book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, which we'll get into in this section as well. Great name, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, I it, wish it, I could it, take The More it, Show it, is it, supported by Mindscape, for that. No, Paranormal, like say, and name. UFO. Um, yeah, uh, but um, we were, just before the break there, we were talking about the possibilities that we are more than our bodies and, right. and what, this, what these implications have. Yeah, I, I think one, one of the uh, great implications is that, uh, you know, um, Joseph Campbell uh, did some marvelous work years ago uh, around the whole uh, issue of myth. And he talked about the hero's journey as being uh, one where the hero would leave the confines of the normally accepted and clearly defined physical world and enter into another dimension or another world of some kind. And um, we tend to think of that as being the whole hero's journey. But Campbell made, I think, a very, very good point. He said that that's only the start of the journey. The really hard part and the most important part is to come back from those experiences and then try to tell others about it and to try and make an impact on the basis of, of what you've learned in that process. And I think that, that we're kind of at a stage right now where I think a number of people have been exploring these, these realms on an individual level. But I think we're, we're, it's now time for us to begin to start using what we've learned and gather a community together that can make an impact on the physical world to the point where we now start not to just have two separate worlds, but to the point where they start to begin to integrate one, one with one another. And when you start to move in those realms, and you, st I think uh, you're, you're then at that point uh, beginning to move in the realms of your deepest passion and in uh, those areas uh, that have a lot to do with why you came into the world in the first place. You know, we have so many people out there who, who just feel like their life is meaningless, that it lacks purpose. And uh, I think a lot of the reason is, is because as a society, we have so thoroughly outlawed anything beyond the physical experience that we're kind of limping through life uh, as, as not complete people, but fractions of people. And we know that something is missing, but we can't often put our, our words around it or uh, point to it because our society just doesn't have the words for it. It doesn't have the, the structures for it. But I think it's time for us to begin to then to create those structures that will help people to more and more consistently discover 
those aspects of their life that are missing at such a deep and important level. And I think uh, that's the direction my life is heading, and I think a lot of other people are picking that up as well. Okay, okay. So, so um, uh, like um, I was saying to a previous guest on this show as well, um, we can embrace these teachings as well for, for, for those who are going through, you know, a rough time right now, for example, uh, maybe Absolutely. financially, maybe um, 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 uh, relationship-wise, maybe both, right? Sure. Um, and by, by, I'm guessing, well, I'm sort of paraphrasing what you're saying here, but by understanding the game in a sense that, that you've chosen to come here, you've, you know, you're, you're, you're playing a character in a sense, um, mm -hmm. you don't have to take what's going so literally. You can sort of set, you know, meditate more and really get down to uh, becoming uh, in charge of, of, of what's happening and, and change, you know, knowing that you've got the power to make a change at any, any instant in the, in the way the game's going, but even though it may not feel that you can make a change when the money's running out, for example. Yeah, you you said a lot there that I I, could, I, I think I could talk uh, for hours on and and uh, um, let's see how much of it we can get into. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with understanding a different context for your life. For most people, and the way we've been raised uh, in our educational system, the way that we look at the world from our scientific worldview, the way that business operates, we think of our lives as, as uh, really being bounded by two bookends. So on the one, there's birth. On the other, there's death. And this me, this person that I am, is directly tied to that time frame between birth and death, and it's directly tied to this physical body. And that's a certain context in which you can view your life. It can be a very legitimate context and a very important one at certain uh, aspects of your journey. But when you begin to understand that there's there's an aspect of your being that, that goes outside of those bookends, that, that transcends the physical body, that uh, lives beyond the confines of time, and you not only know that because somebody else has told you or you've read it in a book, but you've actually experienced it. At that point, your life becomes lived in a very different context. And so the value system uh, of that context is very different from the value system that says we're nothing more than a physical body and that this sense of who I am, this I, dies when my physical body dies. Because once you move beyond those bookends, then you, then you really have to look at questions like, you know, why am I here? Uh, who am I in the larger sense of things? What is my purpose and what is my destiny, not only in this earth, but what is, what is my uh, walking through this uh, earth time? What impact does it have in the, the larger context of life? And those, those get to be really interesting questions, and, uh, and they, they put a, a different spin on, on our, our work in this world for sure. Okay, and um, of, of, of course then, you know, with this work as well, you can prove to yourself in a sense that, you know, life continues by, uh, which we talked about in, in the intro, meeting a, a, a love relative that's passed on by going, by going right. through. Um, is, it, is it regression that, that we're talking about here in a sense? Well, you, you can certainly do it through regression and, and lots of people who have had experiences that generally that, that uh, regression uh, will often be, um, people exploring past lives or future lives or something like that. But it's also possible when you get into these deeply meditative states to um, encounter uh, loved ones uh, who say who have passed on to the other side. I, I had an experience of this myself, uh, again, at the Monroe Institute, my first program. Uh, my father had Alzheimer's disease. And uh, as far as we could tell, for about 12 years before he died, and on the night he died, I was at his bedside, and at, by that point in time, he really didn't know who we were. He didn't know who he was. But there was this glimmer of uh, just the slightest lucid moment. And I, at that moment, I leaned over to my dad, and it was just the two of us in the room. And I said, Dad, when you get to the other side, will you come back and, and tell me what it's all about? And he, he just nodded ever so slightly. It, would, it turns out that those were the last words that I would ever speak to my father while he was uh, alive. Um, Fast forward then about seven years, and I find myself at the Monroe Institute. I'm going through this process, and I'm uh, moving through a space that is not uh, a physical space. I don't really know what it was, but I, there was a sense of movement. 
And as I'm moving along, to, off to my left, I noticed that there was this circle of light beings. And I almost dismissed it and kept on my way. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. That, you don't see that every day. Let's, let's go find out what that's about. So as I came to this circle, I, it parted very slightly. And I could look I looked down and at the, at the, on the floor uh, of this circle of light beings was this person who had obviously come over from just to having passed over from the life and through death. And when I looked even more closely, I suddenly recognized it as my father. Now, remember, my father has died seven years before. Yeah. And now seven years later, I'm in a position where I am welcoming him over to, this, to the land beyond death. And it was uh, stunning to me. And, and that may seem like a very odd thing until you realize that when you get into this work and you start to move beyond the physical compi- confines, time does not have at all the same sense that it does uh, in this world. And so seven years is like nothing there. So here I am. Um, and uh, instinctively, I pick my father up in my arms and I start walking with him, and he's so weak and so limp from the struggle that he's been through that he can't even respond. He's just draped in my arms, and this is all. But yet, I, I'm. It's all very natural for some reason. I I know instinctively what to do, and I'm I'm telling him what's going to happen from that point on. And after a while, uh, one of the beings of light comes to me and takes my father from me, and he says, uh, "We can take him now. His family's coming." And um, you've done a great service. And I'm thinking, well, I've, I've done a great service. Well, I don't even know what I'm doing, really, or how this is happening. And yet here I am. And when I came out of that experience, I was so overwhelmed that, that you know, I couldn't even begin to uh, put it into words because it was such an emotional thing for me because it was nothing I, I could have ever imagined happening. And yet here it was uh, and it was happening to me, just an ordinary guy. And uh, and. It, it really changed my perspective yes. on this idea that, that there's this impenetrable veil between life and death. I don't think it's impenetrable at all. In fact, uh, I think we're deeply influenced uh, and vice versa without even knowing it most of the time. So, so obviously, you know, like I said, I said in the, said in the beginning of the show, you know, your, your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, what does the book sort of tell us about the the reasons of of why we're here as well? Or does it does it even touch on that? Um, I, 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 <laughs> that's a great question, by the way. Um, I think it does by implication. Uh, what I've learned through the years, and what I learned in my work at the Monroe Institute, that uh, my job is not really to supply the answers for other people. Uh, my ja- job is is simply to create a uh, context in which people can explore for themselves because there's a very different category of knowing between um, having somebody else explain it to you and having the actual experience. Um, you can go to, say, Paris, France, and, and um, try to tell somebody about it, but you, you, you can't convey the experience in any way, shape, or form as if somebody was actually to go there themselves. And it's the same with this kind of work. Um, all we can do is to pique curiosity, uh, create the experience for people. And then once they have the experience, then they can put their own philosophy to it, their own words to it, uh, that makes sense to them uh, based on their background. And that's an evolving process that happens over time. It isn't something that happens uh, you know, with the first experience. Gradually, it's like putting together a puzzle for your own self yeah. where the, the pieces individually don't make much sense. But when they uh, come together, it's a mosaic that you go, oh, okay, that, now I understand. Well, no, no, that, that's a great answer. And, and uh, uh, I, no, I really do appreciate your answer there. And so what you're, do- what you're saying as well is that, you know, it, through simple meditation, which you've said this before, you can have that experience yourself. But I mean, what what, what if you feel that that experience? You know, you, you're just making it up. You're you're projecting those images in your head because that's yes. what you want to project. You want to see the relative, right. and you want to hear right. what they want to say. But then, how do you take that as a truth that that there's something more than me in that space? You know, that, and again, that's another great question, and it's a question that dogs a lot of people uh, in in this work. Um, and I can only answer that for myself. Uh, when you find that that you are uh, 
going into these other realms and you're bringing back information that is relevant to your life in the physical world, that's one indication that, that you've got something that's important that's happening. When counselors and advisors start to come to you in a non-physical form and what they say not only makes sense, but it has an impact on your life and on other people's lives, that's another indication. But one of the, I think one of the greatest ways to, to uh, answer that question uh, is to tell you another story about what happened to me. Yeah, please. Um, at the Monroe Institute, uh, there are there are what they call focus levels. These are different discrete states of, of consciousness and awareness that you can go to uh, via the system that they put together. At, well, at one point I was going to uh, – they were taking us for the first time to Focus 21. And Focus 21 for me, I found myself flying over this city of light. And when I say that, it wasn't a city that was lit up by uh, neon bulbs or incandescent bulbs, but the actual buildings themselves were glowing uh, from within, and it was it was uh, a beauty beyond words. Um, and so I was so excited about that. I went and explored different places within this this city and rushed from one place to the other to the other. At one point, I found myself in this auditorium of filled with people of light, and I'm talking to a being of light again, and he's standing off to my left, and he says, welcome. And I say, well, what do you mean, welcome? And he says, well, we've been expecting you. And I said, what do you mean you've been expecting me? I don't even know where I am. And he says, well, that's okay. And at that point, I looked over to my right, and there's an, a woman who's not uh, lit up like everybody else, but he, she's like I am. So anyway, I come out of that experience, and I'm just in a state of awe. And after you go through the experience and the group comes together, and uh, you're able to talk about what happened to you. And so the, one of the first women who uh, raised her hand, she said, you know, I went to this city of light. And she began to uh, talk about some of the same things that I had experienced in there. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh. Somebody else is able to verify this experience. It's incredible. And I was waiting and waiting. And finally, I put up my hand and I said, you know, I went to the City of Light, too. And the woman says, yes, I know. I saw you there. Now, mind you, you know, we're not in the physical body in any way, shape or form. We're not in this even in the same room when those experiences were happening. We have no contact whatsoever. And yet here's somebody else who is able to verify the experience to make it even more interesting. After we were done with the group, we were going to the next experience, and another woman in the group comes up to me, and she says, I want to go to the City of Light, too. And I said, okay, I'll take you there. I don't know why I said that. I just said, okay, I'll take you there. In the next experience, suddenly she popped up in view to me, and I said, oh, yeah, that's right. I was supposed to take you there, and I grabbed her arm, and we just went up to the sky, and we're flying over the city, and I let her go. Afterwards, after this experience, I saw her again before we were meeting as a group, and I said, hey, I took you to the City of Light, didn't I? She, she says, yes, I know, but you and you practically tore my arm off. So when you start to get that kind of verif verification, then you start to realize, hey, maybe this is more than just my imagination. No, again, that's a great story, and that's a great way of answering the question. And uh, you know, I wish we could all have those experiences, but uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to think about that 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 story because it resonates um, uh, a lot of truth as well. So, okay, well, we're going to take a short break. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff. You're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm still joined with my guest, author, and uh, Paul Rademacher of the book A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. And uh, this has been a, uh, a really uh, fascinating um, interview with yourself, Paul. And I know that uh, I wish we had more time, like I say to all my guests, because it's, it's difficult sometimes with such in-depth stuff to, to skip Absolutely. over everything. <laughs> but we're trying to fit this on for te television as well. So, okay, um, sort of jumping in there, um, you know... 
I did ask you before the break, just you know, to sort of sum, try to summarize what, in your opinion, why you think we we are here. Why, what, 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 if we're more than our, more than our body, why would we choose these difficult lives? Do they? I mean, they don't have to be so difficult, but why? Why do we? Why do we tend to to come down here? Um, I think I'll have a better answer to that question when I when I uh, get to the other side. But my provisional answer at this point is that I think there's something that we learn that is extraordinarily valuable uh, to us uh, when we uh, re- revert to our non-physical uh, form. There is uh, uh, an education of the soul, a deepening of the spirit, um, a- an intensifying of uh, compassion. Um, any number of different things. And I, by the way, I, I'm not sure I, I, that everybody comes here for the same reason. I think many people come from, for different reasons. But that's kind of my provisional answer for myself at this point in time. Yes. Um, and that's about as good as I can do. Okay, no, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. And, and how has your family, uh, you know, sort of taken your, 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 t- t- take your work? I mean, how does your kids, as they've got, or, got older, uh, is there an interest from them with what you're doing as well and, and from your wife? Uh, amazingly, yes. Uh, you know, it, it's it's bad enough that my kids had to grow up as a pastor's uh, children, but then uh, uh, a pastor who's gone off the deep end into this uh, into stark raving madness, for some reason, they still think that that's pretty interesting and pretty cool. And uh, they talk about my book to their friends very openly. Um, there, uh, I've got a daughter and my wife who are involved in creating this uh, this next business that is very much wrapped up in what we've been talking about. That's right. So uh, I've had enormous amount of support from my family, and I couldn't ask for more. Oh, well, that's, that's really beautiful. And let's go straight to it, because th- what you're doing here is... Well, I think r- rather, rather interesting and rather important. But um, uh, just explain uh, the the new business that 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 venture that you're about to kick off, and when does it start as well? <laughs> as soon as we can get all the pieces together, and it's it's been a, a more complex puzzle than than we had thought originally, and and the learning curve has been pretty steep. But we're getting close. I'm hoping that within the next thirty days or so, we'll be ready to be up and running. Um, what we're doing is called Lucid Greening. That's G R E E N I N G. Uh, obviously, it's a, a play on the the phrase Lucid Dreaming, but it's also uh, a, a Get, trying to get the idea across lucid being sane or clear and greening in the United States, our money is green. So it's a way of um, uh, trying to find ways in which we can put money into things that I consider to be uh, and lots of other people consider to be uh, built out of sanity rather than the madness that uh, rules our world at this point in time. So uh, we're creating a crowdfunding site for projects that are uh, seeking to integrate spirituality, consciousness development, awakening, transformation, transcendence, those kinds of things, and bring them into our mundane world so that uh, uh, these kinds of projects that have traditionally found it very difficult to to find support will have uh, an avenue uh, to go uh, to to, – find the the funding that they need to bring these kinds of dreams into fruition. When I was at the Monroe Institute, one of the things that was constantly a problem was was money. And I got to thinking that um, why not take this marvelously um, effective model, which is the crowdfunding model, and and bring it to this particular niche uh, so that we can begin to uh, put money to the things that really matter and that really matter not to us just as individuals, but to uh, I think that that will make a, a genuine impact uh, at both the community and the global level, as we begin to f- dis- rediscover the things that we've lost uh, in this world in our preoccupation with the physical reality and our I- ignorance of and dismissal of the uh, realities that lie beyond that. Now these projects that, that go on there, they they, they can either be uh, non-profit making ideas, or they could actually be, you know, uh, people looking for funding for profit making ideas in the realm exactly. of the spiritual. It can be both, can't it? Yes, and it, and it can be um, uh, community efforts too. Uh, 
so th we don't want to limit it, this in any way. The main thing that we're looking for is that in some way it's seeking to integrate these other aspects that I mentioned before, spirituality, consciousness development, awakening, et cetera. That's the real key to it and the niche that we're trying to form. And isn't it interesting that, um, I, I don't know if you've seen uh, David Icke's uh, latest project that he's doing with uh, internet radio and, uh, and an internet TV station. Uh, they've managed to raise uh, over 215,000 so far. I'm sure that figure's going to go up uh -huh. um, uh, on Indiegogo. Okay. And Great. called The People's Voice. And there seems to be a real push for this kind of stuff from people right now. People want that uh, 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 they're asking for a change but isn't it also interesting that the people that fund this stuff are never the people that you know that could fund it with one you know one 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 donation and not really That's miss right. the money it's always the people with no money that that, that, uh, that the, the the individuals who are asking for the change uh, do, do, do you know what i mean it's 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 not always that way but it tends to be the majority uh, of uh, and I think that's the brilliance of crowdfunding is that you can reach such a large audience via social media these days that the small gifts really add up uh, to uh, an enormous amount. When you look at uh, Kickstarter.com, for instance, you know they've they've been in business for a little over four years, and to date they've raised um, in excess of a half of a billion dollars and. That uh, I, I looked at the exchange rate, and I, that's a well over three hundred thousand pounds in a four-year uh, period, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg because the key to this whole thing is, is a community of people who are passionate about something. In the case of Kickstarter, they're passionate about creativity and about the arts. Um, and I think that there's a similar community that is passionate about the exploration of of this um, of spirituality and consciousness and they see this as as tremendously important and so they're willing not only to contribute to it but there's a sense of of participation that that begins to take place where in a sense they they begin to take ownership in the project itself and so there's a tremendous potential here that i think is very much in line with the values of of people who are sensitive to issues that uh, in, in this niche Yes, and I th I think it's great what you're doing. Obviously, there must be a lot of work in the background, uh, you know, still going on to 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 make this a reality. Um, and I you know you know I'm sure that 30 day uh, notice that you gave us there could change. But we'd like to support you. We'd like to be able to you know thank you pu push this you know and 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 help you uh, in the little way that we can when you do launch it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're we're looking for all the help that we can get. I think if we can if we can get over that initial hump, which is to make sure that we've got some projects on on the uh, to start with, so people aren't coming to an empty website, then then we'll be in great shape. Because I think that this will have an enormous momentum uh, in and of itself because it's meeting a real need. You know that people who have been on the spiritual path have always had a difficult time with this whole issue of money. Uh, in <laughs> fact, it's so many people feel like in order to be spiritual, you have to kind of turn your back on money or, or you have to make a choice. Am I going to be spiritual or am I going to follow my career? But what if, what if we were to provide uh, another alternative for that? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do through Lucid Greening is to say, hey, look, if you've got something that you consider to be really important and it falls within this niche, we're betting that there's a community out there who, who believes enough in you to want to contribute to what you're doing. And I think that that's going to open up whole new possibilities for people that have never existed before as they deal with this this very strange and often difficult intersection between money and spirit. Yes, and 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 I think um, it, it's such a it's so true what you say as well. And it's such a shame that the bigger networks, um, you know, you know, don't uh, value these subjects, um, uh, you know. As they could do, and you know, give people an, an alternative opinion on on on, on ideas and, and 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 processes. It's always down to well, that doesn't fit in with the uh, editorial regulations, and we've got to be careful what we say because <laughs> people are so stu silly and they don't, you know, they can't right. think for themselves, right. you know, you know, and sue. We we can't be sued, and you know, but the world is changing. I mean, it's people like you, you know, as well that that are making that change. I mean, you you know, by by doing stuff like this. So you know, really well done. So um. 
Oh, okay, and and I don't feel like as well with, with your book that we've uh, sort of uh, gone over enough in detail. Uh, but That's you can okay. you can get your book from uh, Amazon and other great uh, book outlets, can't you? Uh, primarily on Amazon at this point in time. Yeah, primarily Amazon. Okay. Uh, you know, one question that keeps springing to my mind as well, um, uh, um, uh, and we did get a text in for this question as well from Simon from uh, Abbey Gavenny in Wales, is, you know, why, why did you leave the Institute as well? And I know that's sort of going back uh, there, but let's ask that question. That, that's a long story. Uh, so I've got, to do, I've got to give the very short version Please. of that. Please. <laughs> um, one of the things about being on the spiritual path is that you never know where the spirit's going to call you next, and um, and that's a very difficult thing for most people. But it's happened enough times in my life that I began to see the signs in that that there was something new that was opening up for me. I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was enough to create a restlessness within me to say, you know, I, I've got to follow this energy where it's going to go, and that energy has eventually led me to this initiative with this lucid greening enterprise. I still love the institute. I have still have great, great feelings for it and uh, support its work uh, uh, 100%. But there, there comes a time when, when it's also important to give somebody else a chance to uh, move it in a, in a different direction. And uh, so the timing was right. Uh, my inner uh, leading was right and so on. So uh, I haven't regretted it at all. Well, wonderful. Again, you know, you know, trust your feelings like you like you said in the interview, and you know, and believe that uh, you know that you can succeed if it's if it's something that you're really passionate about about seeing through, no matter what shifting sand is going on under your feet as well. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. And would you like to give a a, a final uh, a word to the audience as well that the, the platform is yours? Okay. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that if you have a project that you would like to fund that follows in the, those categories I mentioned, uh, please let us know. Uh, you can contact us at info at lucidgreening.com. You can watch the website as it's under construction at, at www.lucidgreening.com. I'm also going to be starting a blog, and we'd love for you to sign up for that. Uh, that that blog will be a part of that website, and we'd love to uh, have you be a part of this emerging community because this is much bigger than any one person or any group of people because we're looking to create a global community that can begin to make a, a genuine impact on this world. Well, Paul Rudmaker, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. Well, we've come to an end on tonight's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on The More Show's official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. And you may also find out more on all past and upcoming guests on themoreshow.co.uk. And do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe.